Glam Metalcast discuss their top seven rock and metal drummers. Wow, you've got Metal Mike here, and I've got a special guest with me. He's a radio, TV, podcast guy, and a rock drummer. Let me introduce you to Shane Christopher Neal. Yeah! What's up, buddy? Very, there we go. (laughs) Hey, listen, I'm always excited to talk to a guy by the name of Metal Mike. And with the Shane Christopher Neal... You know, there's three there's three names there, obviously, just like most serial killers. So I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> yeah, but didn't uh, all the cast of, like, 90210 had three names, too, didn't they? Yeah, well, I was on that uh, show as well. Same with Beverly Hills, 90210, and, uh, yeah, good. <laughs> well, man, I'm excited to have you here. We're going to talk about seven favorite drummers, and it sounds like we might have, uh, we might come from different paths with these, but I think we'll come together and probably agree on a lot of them. But before we jump in, man, tell everybody about some of the things that you do. Yeah, so I've been in uh, radio and TV for a number of years, uh, host classic rock radio, uh, one with, with Giant FM here in Ontario, which is uh, probably the biggest station here. I left there about a year ago uh, just for a number of reasons. I didn't have time to, to kind of follow their commitments that they needed from me, but uh, I host a, a classic rock show on Classic 1220 Radio down here in southern Ontario. I have a TV show called BS Live Rocks, and BS stands for Bobby, who's my partner, and my, my name's Shane obviously, and um, we, we have a TV show that is basically there to support local bands. So we record it a couple times a month, record um, at, a, at a local, you'd love this, at a local pub here in town. So there's food and drinks available, and we interview artists that are independent artists, some cover bands, and it airs on TV, not live, but um, and it's a lot of fun, and we like to support the, the indie you know, music scene here. So... I do that, and my podcast, I have a, a podcast called the Industry 45 Podcast Show, which is, I don't know how many years I've had it, five or six years, and like you, Mike, I get to interview a lot of great artists. In fact, we're going to talk drummers, and one of the guys I get to interview tomorrow, not when you're hearing this podcast tomorrow, but in real time tomorrow, <laughs> is Dean Castronovo from the band Journey, so Sick. I'm excited about that. So I do a bunch of interviews like you do, and uh, I want to commend you, man. you got a great book. Uh, hair metal journey. I read it and I love it. And I called you and, and texted you right away. And you man were the guy to kick me in the ass because I've been trying to think of a concept for a book. And I wanted to write a book for years. Didn't know what to do. And I got your book and I went, you know what? I love the concept. So did I steal the concept from you? Absolutely. <laughs> However, <laughs> the content is very different because the artists that I interview uh, just seem to be a lot different than the ones that you kind of chat with. So there, there's no stories that are the same, but the concept was really great. I love the way you put the book together. Um, and what I love is you could pick up anywhere. And if you like the band or an artist, you know, you could read more into it. And if you didn't, you would just skip it and go to the next one. Uh-huh. Right. And that's kind of how I position it. So I am writing a book called interviews and conversations coming out this year and uh, I'm getting there, but you know, man, it's a slow process. Uh-huh. It doesn't, it's not easy to listen, listen back to all those interviews and try to pick up points that people might, be interested in so pretty soon i want to add author to my name just yeah. like you there yeah. you have well man well I'll, I'll send you a check for saying those kind words appreciate it uh but <laughs> no yeah i mean it, it is a process uh but you know you feel a, a, a quite a bit of accomplishment once you get it done so i wish you the best with it if there's anything i could ever do to help not that i'm the greatest but i've done one so i got one under my belt and hopefully do more and just to let everybody know who's listening i Took, uh, I don't even want to admit this yet because it's, I know it's going to take me time, but I started reading it as an audio book. And you think it would be easy, but it's not. <laughs> That's all I want to say. You're like the hardest working guy in show business, my friend. <laughs> so proud of you. Do a great job. All right, man. You know what? I'm ready to, to rock and roll with these drummers. But let, let's talk about, like, just basic about, like, drummers, man, because I think in the 80s, Drummers kind of got pushed to the forefront a little more, you know? Guys like Tommy Lee, he made it just look cool to be a drummer with spinning drum set and all this kind of stuff. You know, all those guys, Bobby Blotzer, Eric Carr, I think there was a little bit more spectacle to what a drummer was doing in the 80s. What do you think? Well, and it fit the music, right? Like you had this real dynamic music, you had great guitar solos, and you had all this hair and you had a drummer who really in that era, uh, like you said, brought it to the front of the stage. And I, I've always, you'll, you'll notice by the list that I'm going to give you once we get there, a lot of the, the guys that I like were showmen. And there's a lot of people that didn't make my top seven that I'll probably touch on. 
they were all the guys like you said, Eric Carr. I mean, I mean the, the stage. I remember going to see the Kiss show, and the stage would remember come out to the front, and they would have him play the drum solo. And you mentioned Tommy Lee, and the you get the roller coaster going, and you get all of those things that did not happen in the '70s. Some great drummers in the '70s, clearly, but. When it came to the 80s, all of a sudden, they upped their game. And that's where I, I'll be honest with you, that's where I fell in love with the drums. Because I was born in 69. My dad was a jazz drummer. He taught me the basic rudiments and stuff. But I didn't give a shit. I wanted to, to put in Van Halen's album. I wanted to put in <laughs> Motley Crue's album. Not because the music was any better. It's just because the drumming was so awesome, dynamic, and it's just the visualization of playing those type of songs in front of a sold out Madison Square Garden just blew my mind. So mm -hmm. I agree with you. Yeah. And here a couple things I'll just explain myself where some of my picks came from. Creativity, power, the sound of the drums. And then I also think a few of my guys, and I'll point it out, they had something to prove. And I think when a drummer or any musician has something to prove, that's going to bring out the best in them. Absolutely. All right, man. I'm ready. What do you got for your number seven? Okay, my number seven, um, drumming skill-wise, I would say is very average, but we just talked about the, the bringing the drummer to the forefront. And when I saw this band play in Hamilton, Ontario, and I've seen them a number of times over the years, uh, this would have been the early 90s, but um, it, just watching this guy play drums, his hair, his long blonde hair, he was about 125 pounds, I think, soaking wet. He had this big cage around him playing. That is Blast Elias from the band Slaughter. Nice. Um, I was a, such a huge fan in the, you know, the Stick It To You album, Up All Night, Flight of the Angels, Mad About You. Wildlife, I thought, was a great album. But I just think visually, when I went to see the show, and I love Mark Slaughter, and I know Mark Slaughter. You probably know him. And he's a super awesome guy. But it was Blast Elias that, to me, really brought that band, uh, you know, to the forefront for me. And, of course, the videos. When you watch the video for Up All Night, right, or Flight to the Angels, they really focused in on this guy who was, you know, twisting and turning while he's playing drums. And just the visualization was killer. Was the drumming over the top? No, it was average. But he's my number seven because that's where it all began for me, watching that kind of guy playing drums. I think that's a great one, and he totally missed my radar. But a couple of points is when you were talking that I thought about him. Well, first of all, you know, he had a some pretty good hair you know he, he he looked cool all right that's number one number two his setup was quite interesting right because he had those bass drums behind him and they had messages and stuff on him right he had words on his drums that were that were behind him and then he also had a, just a giant kit in the cage so he, i think he had a cool setup he looked cool and then the sound quality of that album is just phenomenal and i think that's where some of mine come from it's like when the drums sound good and it's all working i mean that's huge I think he was playing a Ludwig kid at the time, uh, stainless steel, I believe. Mm -hmm. And at the and you know, back then, you know, I don't know that a lot of drummers did. And I really feel like again the sound of those albums and even live uh just blew my mind. So yeah. Yeah, definitely a big sound. All right, my number seven man is a weird one. I'm not even I'm still trying to figure out is is this was this the right choice? But I'm I'm gonna defend it and I'm gonna stand by it. We start off with an album, and I think this is the album where I feel that this guy had something to prove. He stepped up his game, and it sounds killer. And the album is Vince Neil Exposed. And the drummer is Vicky Fox, man. I, I really like Vicky Fox. Now, when you um, listen to uh, the Enough's Enough albums, you know, it's decent. It's solid, but it's not music where you can go really crazy. I think once you got into the Vince Neil band, I mean, you're kind of like, you got Steve Stevens, who's just shredding. You got Vince that has something to prove just coming out of Motley Crue. And I think Vic Fox, man, just, just blew it away. It's just incredible. And I really love the drumming and like how it sounds. I think, once again, you got modern day production with Ted Temple, Templeman and all that kind of stuff. So it sounds really cool. But if you look at listen to some of the songs, and I don't know how familiar you are with this album, but if you look at the Vince Neil solo album, stuff like Look in Her Eyes, The Edge, they do a cover of Sweet, Set Me Free, and he's just killing it, man. He's just railing on the drums, real tight, 
all the fills and everything like makes sense. Like it's, it's not out of control. It, that doesn't fit with the music or something like that. So I think it's uh, another one of those guys. A cool guy, nice sound, tight drumming, and uh, really had the chops. And I think he showed it on this album. Maybe not as much as he did. You know, enough's enough. He just didn't get an opportunity to really show it. What do you think of that choice? You know, I, I, I'm always. Uh loving Vic Fox. He played in the Veronicas, if you ever check them out on, yep. on YouTube, and and did a great job with them. But you're invited, but your friends can't come and all. You know, just visually, again, we were talking about how, you know, bringing the drums to the forefront, and he was another guy that just, you know, did just that. I remember doing an interview with uh, Donnie V last year, maybe it was, or a couple of years ago, and, and we were talking about Vic Fox, and just the energy and it's all about just that that coolness that yep. rock attitude yeah. and you know again you brought somebody up just like i did with Bloss elias no one's going to look at vic fox or Bloss elias and go these guys technically are some of the best drummers of that era they are not but it didn't matter because they did what they needed to do to serve the song and more importantly to bring the vis visualization to those live shows because those were the good times and you know this in the 80s and 90s going to those rock concerts, and it really was about visualization. And that's a great choice. I, I didn't even think of Vic Fox as much as I you know, love Vic Fox, but good on you for that. You know, the other thing, too, like about the Vince Neil Exposed album, you know, we all know like it came out at a really bad time and it was a flop, but people go back to that album because it's a really timeless album. Like, you listen to it and you, you would think it was made in, like, 1989 or something. You, have, you know, it doesn't sound like a 90s album because of, you know, obvious reasons. It's not grungy or anything like that. So, you know, to just have an album like that, and then it's an album like you just keep revisiting because, like I said, it's timeless. It's got great musicianship, great production, and I think, like I said, I think Vic Fox is a big piece of uh, the, the really great sound of that album. So Absolutely. Good All choice. Right. Good choice. Metal Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm telling you, I wasn't going to go for the typical stuff. I think as you get to the end, it starts to get a little typical. All right, uh, number six. All right, I don't know if you're going to know this name, but uh, I'll tell you why I chose this drummer. One, he's from Ontario, Canada, where I'm from. And he played in one of my favorite bands in the early 90s. And not only, now this guy has drum chops, does he ever have vocal chops? Darren James Smith played in the band Harem Scarum. Mm. And I don't know if you've listened to Harem Scarum or know much about them, but they had some great albums. Their first album was very kind of pop oriented. Harry Hess was the guy who wrote the songs, him and Pete Les Bronze. But they, like every other band, they had a lot of years to put their first album together. <laughs> and they were songwriters. So they came up with kind of a pop rock album, but they put this album out called Mood Swings. And if you've not checked this out, Metal Mike, it is absolutely off the charts. The drumming, the band sound, you'd love it. It's heavy, but it's still melodic rock. And not only is he a great drummer, but he's a great singer. And he sang a song called Sentimental Boulevard on Mood Swings. I encourage anybody to check out that song. And to show you he's a good singer, he became the singer in Red Dragon Cartel, the Jakey e. Lee band. He was the lead singer in the band, okay? Oh. Think of that. And all, and also right now, uh, because Harem Scarum's not together at the moment, uh, he's actually in a White Snake tribute band here in Canada, and I believe he's the singer. So I I don't know that for sure, but I think he's doing Mr. David Coverdale, and he, and he is. If you go to Toronto and say Darren James Smith, they just look at you and they just go, that man's a legend. But boy, did he ever have <laughs> drumming chops! Check out the album Mood Swings, Darren James Smith, right here in Canada, my number six choice. That's a great pick. I, I can't say that I know him specifically, but I know Harem Scarum. My buddy Ryan, who's always on the podcast with me, he he's always talking about Harem Scarum. So good on you, man. That's that's a good pick. All right, for my number six. What you got? What you got, Metal Mike? Right, what you got? All right, we got Doc Wackles from Sabotage. Everybody knows I'm a Sabotage nut. I had Doc on the podcast quite a few years back, and one thing that he explained to me, Shane, was that when he was a young man, like in high school, he used to jam with Chris Oliva. They, they, these guys have been were in a band together for a very long time, and it was just the two of them a, a lot of times, you know, after school or whatever. And basically, what he told me is Doc said that he followed Chris's guitar playing, and you know that's kind of unusual, right? Because as a drummer, you know the drum 
traditionally is supposed to follow the bass player. But since these guys always jam together and they, they had a good vibe going together, he always followed him. So if you listen to songs like Gutter Ballet, when like it goes, do, 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 like the drums follow that precisely. Now, there's no reason why they have to do that. But if you go back and like I said, you listen to that interview, those guys were really tight and jammed all their lives. So I just thought that was cool. And when I mentioned that to him, I said, man, I go, you know, as a drummer, you follow the guitar player. And he's like, that's so cool you noticed that. He goes, nobody's ever said that to me. And he goes, you're exactly exactly spot on. So I'm going to pat myself on the back right now. You can't see me, but I'm doing that. But um, so, you know, I picked up on that, of how tightly, you know, he followed the music and he followed the guitar. But he's got a lot of killer stuff, man. You know, like White Witch off of uh, Hall of the Mountain King, Gutter Ballet, uh, Edge of Thorns he plays on too, which I think is a great album. And another thing, we got to get back to the visuals, right? This is another dude. You know, he's Dr. Kill Drums. That's his name, you know, that's his nickname. And his drum set was always mammoth. It always had like some weird, you know, skull faces on the on the bass drums. It was always in a cage like type of mechanism. So Doc Wackles, man, are you familiar are you a sabotage guy? You like sabotage? I don't know them like you do. <laughs> I know that I thought they were very much like um like a almost like a prog rock band. Were they not though? Or uh, am I wrong? They, no, you're that? you're right. It's it's just something that they developed into. They were more a straight ahead, just you know, straight up like power model. Okay. And then they turned into a little bit of prog rock as they got going. And then ultimately they became the Trans Siberian Orchestra. So I'm a big fan right. of Doc. He's somebody that I've stayed connected with uh online over the years and I just I always loved his playing and I always loved Sabotage. So that's why I got it there. Well, what's, what's nice about doing a podcast, like the one that you're doing or, or the one that I do, is that when people bring things up, it makes you think, I need to go check that out. I need yep. to understand what he's talking about. So I definitely am going to check out some uh, YouTube videos of the band because I'm not nearly that familiar with them. Other than, again, I knew that there was some tie to Trans-Siberian Orchestra, and I thought they were kind of proggy. That's all I got for you on that. <laughs> yeah, no problem. You made a great point. We get, and you probably do too. We get messages all the time from people. Oh, thanks for mentioning Lily and X. I missed them when I, you know, was listening to music. Or thanks for mentioning this band, yeah. that band, and it's great because it's stuff like like you and I. Maybe we've been listening for years, but this other person out there just it missed their radar. There was just so much coming out in the eighties and nineties. It was very easy to miss somebody, so no doubt. Absolutely. All right, brother. Number five. So let it rock. Let it roll. Okay, so I want to be clear on something that when I came to, to thinking about a list, I thought of who was I listening to in the 80s and early 90s? What inspired me as a drummer? And, and kind of, you know, I was a radio guy. Like, I listened to pop radio. So a lot of stuff that you might mention, I might go, like Sabotage, I go, okay, well, they weren't on, Case, they weren't on Casey Kasem's, you know, <laughs> top 40. So, so I probably would have heard of them right away. Maybe in later years I'd dive into it, but... Um, my, my number, he's not, a, he's not a metal guy for sure, but number five on my list is somebody I so respect as a drummer, uh, as an influencer, and, and just as a person. That's Kenny Arnoff. You nice. know, uh, he's played from the Smashing Pumpkins to Bruce Springsteen to Paul McCartney, uh, Lady Gaga, Bruno Mars, of course, uh, huge playing with uh, John Cougar Mellencamp or John Mellencamp or John Cougar or whatever rendition you want to <laughs> call him. Um, but a couple of reasons for, for well, I, I mentioned some of the reasons, but you know, being a guy that played on a number of albums, he had a number one hit. Think about this with, 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 with Belinda Carlisle called heaven is a place on earth, made it number one on, you know, pop radio. And at the time he's in a band or playing with, you know, the likes of Mellencamp and Springsteen and like this guy could transcend to do anything. He was just like this chameleon that could just figure a way to play the proper drum part as he says, get a song on the radio and get it to number one. And of course, you probably know it with Bon Jovi. He played on the album Blaze of Glory yep. and the song and, and you know, just showing you his talent. But obviously, the most famous, the reason I would pick him is because anybody in a moment that was asked to pick a drum part and, and, and Jack and Diane comes and plays that little solo that literally saved his career and is played by everybody when they're at a bar and drunk trying to play air drums to that little <laughs> drum part. I mean, I mean, I know he's not a metal guy, but Kenny Arnoff can do it all. And I've seen him play double bass, okay, and kick some ass with some heavy heavy hitters, like even, you know, he plays uh, with Sammy Hagar, right? Yep. And I'm I just a big fan of Kenny Arnoff, so I had to throw him on the list because I so respect what he did in the 80s. 
uh, in, in rock and roll as a drummer. You know, I, I could be wrong, and if I'm wrong, maybe I'll edit it out, maybe I won't, but I believe he played on Cinderella's album Still Climbing. So he's got a little bit of hair metal street cred. So even though he doesn't have any hair yeah. himself, he's got no hair, but he's he got hair. No, metal he doesn't. Cred. He's like me, bald as can be. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting there, no worries. Okay. Um, what you got? All right, so my next one, this is going to be one where you're going to know the band. You might not know this member because he was kind of a member who just didn't stay in this band very long. It's not his fault. It's like the original guy, or one of the, the main guys left, and then he came back. But... Everybody knows I'm a big Man of War fan. And there is an album from 1992 called The Triumph of Steel, and they brought in a new drummer, and his name was Rhino, right? Just Rhino. And uh, he, he hit those drums like a wild rhino. And the cool thing was, was you know, it goes back to what I said before. This was this guy had something to prove. I don't know if you, how familiar you are with Manowar, but Manowar is a band of, uh, of talent. You know what I mean? You've got, you've got Joey DeMaio flying around on the bass. Eric Adams is singing up in the stratosphere. Uh, and then depending on who who has on guitar for that album, it's, they're a shredder. So you've got to be on the top of your game to be in Manowar. Now, the thing I like about this album, and maybe I'm, I'm starting to see a trend of what I like about drummers, but this guy does some pretty interesting things that follow the music. Of course, there's some you know light speed double bass, but there's also times where it's restrained and it, and it fits... Uh, you know, appropriately with the songs, but then there's all these little accents that follow the music that are just really cool, really intricate. So I love it, man. Just go back and listen to like the speed of uh, Ride the Dragon, and then there's another song, Spirit Horse of the Cherokee, where he lays back and he plays more like a Native American beat, but at the very end he's just like, just just going sick. So there's and then last but not least, it also goes back to sound quality. This album came out in 1992. And the production levels, and they're on Atlantic Records, so everything's jiving with production, and it sounds really good. So there's talent. I like the kind of vibe he's putting out, following the instruments and everything, and I also like the sound quality. So Rhino, something to prove. 1992 Man of War. And you like him because he's from upstate New York somewhere. <laughs> they're from upstate New York, <laughs> like me. <laughs> right? Uh, what were they from? Auburn, New York, or something? Auburn, you got it. Yeah, yeah. I, I know the band, and I, I, I have seen, you know, YouTube videos of Man of War. Um, did he not have the big drum cage, too, or am I thinking about somebody else? Uh, he probably had. I mean, he, that, they always have big kits and stuff, so they probably had some cage stuff going on. The main, Now, I want to just give a throw, uh, a shout-out to Scott Columbus. He, rest in peace, he passed away. But, like, he, like, Scott Columbus was there, Rhino came in for an album, and then Scott came back. So I do really enjoy Scott Columbus, too. But I think, there was, like I said, there's just something about that. Like, a new guy comes in, a younger dude, he's ready to rock, he's going crazy. You know? So I just I love that album, and, and I'm a big fan of Rhino. Does the band still not play? They still play. Yeah, they're um they're yeah, gonna be I thought, uh, I thought so, yeah. yeah they're still going. And you know who their guitar player is now, which it really is, excites me, is Michelangelo from uh, Nitro. Oh, nice. So very. Okay, cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, very cool. Okay, buddy. That's why I'm on this podcast, so you can teach me things. Dude, I'm gonna, we're going to educate each other. Uh, I think I, I didn't know Tom, or, uh, Tommy Arnoff. I didn't know Kenny Arnoff. I don't know if I knew he played on Bon Jovi. I knew he played on the Cinderella, so I'm learning stuff, too. Um, yeah, all right, glory. so we are one, two, three. We are at number four, buddy. What do you got? Okay, so you're going to know this this drummer and this band. And again, uh, I reiterate that I kind of grew up in, in the radio space. So at the time, obviously, the ballads that would hit the radio... Uh, you would listen to, and then I would go and buy the albums or whatever they were, CDs at the time, uh, maybe even cassettes, I don't know. But I would listen to more of the B-sides and, and album cuts and stuff like that. But this next drummer, um, stylistically, I don't know, he was a left-handed drummer playing a right-handed kit. He could sing, but I fell in love with the band and the songs, and for whatever reason, he just brought them to life. That is none other than Steven Sweet of the band Warrant. Yeah. He is a challenge. You know, I, Good I, call. Oh, absolute, absolute talent. And he was, I believe he was a guitar player or something before he was a drummer. But he kind of drums a little with his hi-hats with his left hand. And, you know, a little bit awkward, if you, if you will, at times. But he's got some really unique drum fills. And I believe that's because he's left-handed. 
but he's playing a right-handed kit. So I think he leads a lot of times with his left hand as opposed to someone would lead with their right hand. So it changes the tonality of some of those fills. And I used to just love listening, especially to the first album, Dirty Rotten, Filthy Stinker Rich, came out in, in 89, and so many great songs. But it was the ballads who caught my attention because, again, I listened to radio. Sometimes she cries, heaven. You know, I was a big fan of the song Big Talk. I love yeah. the drumming in that song. It's got a really cool groove. And, of course, Cherry Pie, when it came out, he had some great songs on that album. Song and Dance Man, Love and Stereo. Some of the songs that, you know, somebody may not know because they were never radio hits. Uncle Tom's Cabin, our band played that for years. But, you know, from, from the first two albums were great. But I'm going to tell you something. In 1992, they put out Dog Eat Dog. And, and I think you, if, if you have heard it great, if you, if you haven't, that is your cup of tea. It is heavy. It is really edgy. I spoke to Joey Allen a couple times doing interviews with him, with Warren. And that album really was a great album. The timing of the album sucked. Yep. Yep. <laughs> you know, in 1992. But, but it was a great album, great drumming on that album. And I think um, Stephen played on Born Again in 96. And then I think everybody in the fucking world played drums in Born, including me, I think, <laughs> up until 2011 when they put out Workaholic. But he's back in the band now. I saw them uh, a year ago. I think it was a year ago. And he's still kicking ass. You know, the whole band is doing great. I miss Jenny Lane, one of my favorite singers of all time. Uh, but Robert Mason's doing a great job. But, but Stephen Sweet had something in my heart. I saw him in Toronto. The band opened up for Poison on the Cherry Pie tour, and and I just they really captured me as a live band and awkward but very visual and one of my favorites, Stephen Sweet from Warren, number four. That's a great one. And if, well, let me just say, of course, dude, Doggy Dog. We're, we're big fans of Doggy Dog on this podcast for sure. But um, I think you made some great points. I, I don't know why he missed my radar, but he really is. He was he you know. He kind of was in sync with the band, with the moves. I feel like when the band was swaying, he was swaying. You know, what I mean? he kind of <laughs> yeah. he, he did his best that he could. You know, being stuck behind a kit, but he is a talented drummer. I do like all the songs that you mentioned. I started to think about some of the fills and the things that he was doing, and also he's a great vocalist. He always backs up and does the harmonies. With Amazing. Jay. So yeah, yeah, dude, I love Warren, and that was a great call. All right. All right. Thank now, you. How about your number four, Mr. Metal Mike? All right. Now, I'm going to butcher this poor man's name, and, and unfortunately, he has passed away. But it's, I'm going to give it a shot, and I think it's Muntaka Higuchi, the uh, drummer of loudness, the original drummer of loudness. Freaking amazing, man. I've been going back, and I've been listening to all these different Loudness albums that I have, and it's just so killer, man. He's so good. Let's face it. Loudness is the Japanese Van Halen, basically. I mean, you've got Akira on guitar, which is, is just so killer. Drumming is killer. The bass is out of control, too. The only weak link for me, and it's I mean, a lot of people would say David Lee Roth was the weak link, you know, like musicianship-wise in Van Halen. Was the was the was Menora the singer? I always felt like you know I like him, but I understand why they couldn't become huge with him at the helm. I like the albums where they had Mike Vissera, uh on there because that was uh, it. Just sounded more in tune with what I was used to at, at that point. But I do I dig both. But musicianship of this band is off the charts. It doesn't they don't get the credit that they deserve. You know, go back and listen to some of the stuff like Who Knows. Who knows Uh, it's all like weird off time, almost sounds Iron Maiden-y at times. The whole Soldier of Fortune album kicks ass. If, if, listen to the song Demon Disease. But this guy, he hits his drums very hard, it's very powerful, and all the fills are very intricate. And he does a lot of weird off time stuff, man. But I'm a big loudness fan, and I just think the drumming on, on those uh, 80s and early 90s albums is just killer, man. Do you, did you get into loudness at all? Uh, a little bit. But again, you know, not something that was on my radar. Number one, because I'd never been to Japan and there's too many <laughs> names I couldn't say in the band. But, uh, you know, I was familiar with them. Let's just say that. And, and I would hang around. I hung around a lot of people that listened to heavier rock music than I did. And I remember we'd go to parties and loudness would be on. And I'd say, why is this so loud? <laughs> because it's loudness. Oh, anyway, yes. that's. You know, nice. Thank God I'm not a comedian. But uh, yeah, and this is what, again, I love about it is now I'm writing these down thinking I got to check more of this out. 
you know, after we hang up here and uh, check out some of these drummers that you mentioned. Yeah, I, I'm telling you, you're going to love it. All right. I bet you as we get down to the wire, we're going to get some bigger names. I'm thinking. I'm curious to see what you got. So what's your number three? Okay, I'm going to tell you right now, if I had a million dollars, I'm going to bet that this guy is on your list. Um, because you can't think of rock drumming in the 1980s without thinking of Tommy Lee. And, and that I'm, you know, he's just, that's what he is, okay? One of the greatest of all time when it comes to rock and roll drumming. Uh, everybody here listening to your podcast knows who Tommy Lee is, so I don't need to explain that clearly. But you know what? Early on, some of the songs like Live Wire, uh, Looks That Kill were great. Our band plays Home Sweet Home, Tasteful Drumming, uh, really thought out, you know, it wasn't just a madness of double bass and a lot of drum fills, always thought out and methodical. Uh, same old situation when you get to that song or Wild Side, some really killer, and people think it's easy, like same old situation, and we play the song, so I know. It's not that it's hard. It's just the sound and the way that Tommy hits the drums and plays. And you know what? There's been other drummers in Motley Crue over the years, uh, when Tommy was in jail and the band had some issues and, and, and they were great drummers, but I will tell you that just nobody can bring that sound to the forefront like Tommy Lee. There'll never be another one. And obviously we talked about it off the top, the visualization, anybody that's on a roller coaster or flipping upside down, uh, just was a real creative person. And, and actually from what I could gather, and I've never interviewed Tommy Lee, uh, but the, I know a lot of people who have that just said he's just a super chill, cool dude. Um, he got in a lot of trouble in his life, but he created a lot of great music. And so Tommy Lee is a pioneer of the 80s era of rock drummer. He's number three on my list. I got Tommy Lee for number three as well. So, yeah. Oh, my God! <laughs> <laughs> you know, one, I think a great example of, of the really show early on where he was just killing it is Bastard. I mean, Bastard, it, it starts off with drums, and it's just got that powerful beat. And I love the kind of oddball stuff he's doing during the verses when it's just like the him and, him and Vince kind of together. Uh, it, it's really ahead of its time, man. It's really cool. And I think as he got going, I think he just got better and better. Unfortunately, like you said, Motley Crue took some you know commercial downturns and stuff like that. But if you listen to the drumming that's on like the Motley 94 album... It's amazing and it's mammoth. It, it's like it'll it'll crush your skull. You know what I mean? When he does some of these yeah. giant fills, it, it, it's really killer stuff. I mean, even on Generation Swine, Let Us Pray. So, I mean, all the stuff, you, you know, Kickstart My Heart, Dr. Feel Good. There's just, like you said, it's not, some of it, it doesn't, it's not that it's that complicated. It's just how he plays it. He hits the thing so damn hard. He's got swagger that you can just hear inside of the playing. You know what I mean? He really fit perfectly with Motley Crue because... Once again, it was one of those bands. It was kind of like the Beatles and Kiss. You knew every guy in that band. And because of what he did, the way he played, you know, he was known even more. And for some of his uh, out of uh, out of the band antics, he was known as well. But but when you think about, I've always thought the musicians of that band were Mick Mars and Tommy Lee. If you didn't have those guys in the band, I don't think you really had a band. It, you know, the other obviously Vince was important, but it was more style over substance. Nicky was a great songwriter, not the greatest bass player. So I think those two really made that band what it was. So I, on the music side of it, well, you know, you mentioned Generation Swine, and I always bring this up because I know the song is not necessarily even a rock song, but the way that Tommy Lee created a part in the song Glitter blew my mind. And when I saw the Carnival tour, um, and, and they played glitter and I kind of thought to myself, man, like that's a guy who really gets it. Like he gets where he can drive the train and he mm -hmm. also gets where he is just here, you know, to, 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 to play what he needs to play to make a song great. And I will tell you this about a month ago, I interviewed Tom Werman, who, who, as you probably know, uh, produced a number of Motley Crue records. Yep. Yep. And he had said to me that the Motley Crue boys in the studio, especially Tommy Lee, we're always focused, we're always hardworking, we're always trying to be better. Yeah, the antics outside the studio and all the parties, and Tom said he didn't partake in that, that wasn't his thing, 
you know, they went to do their things. But when they came in the studio the next day, even if they didn't sleep, those boys came to work and rock. And Tommy Lee, he said, was the most polite guy to work with. He always listened to anything that you have to offer him. And he just had this natural talent and was super awesome to work with. So that's great to hear about a guy that you and I both truly love, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that, that was really cool. And one cool thing is people bust his balls because he, he went down the, you know, the rap path or this path at least you could say he was he was somebody who was always willing to kind of like uh advance himself and try some different things he was he never seemed like a guy that just wants to rest on his laurels and even look at like the the antics with the drum set for the the for right. his drum solos right i mean he always was trying to up his game spinning drum set going over the crowd doing it as a roller coaster so you got to give the guy credit he's pretty innovative he's open to fresh ideas not all of them always work but but i, I give the guy a lot of credit man he's a pretty smart dude and he does a lot of cool stuff, so good for him, man. Well, and the problem, the problem, Mike, is that everybody wants somebody to stay in the same lane that they know them from, i.e., right. Shout at the Devil. You know, Tommy, you, you, you are a drummer on Shout at the Devil, right? So at the end of the day, we want you to always be that guy. And he says, well, no, I want to play hip-hop, and I want right. to play rap. And, like, I, I, you know, like you have to grow as a person and as an artist – and I, I applauded Tommy for doing that. Anything that he did, including that fucking terrible TV show that he did, uh, I applaud the guy, you know? Like, he tries. You know? At least he tries, right. All right, we're down to the wire here. We got two left each. So what is your number two? So number two is definitely not going to make your list because it's way too pop. Uh, <laughs> but it was the guy that I got into early on when I was learning some really cool drum parts that, again, were on the radio. I was always a big fan of the band Night Ranger, and I loved the melodic songs and just some of the drumming parts And Don't Tell Me You Love Me, Secret of My Success, Four in the Morning, of course, like Sister Christian and then the ballad. But but Kelly Keggy is on my list because not only do I think that Kelly is somewhat of a friend of mine because <laughs> I've talked to him, uh, you know, more than once, and he's always given me advice as a drummer, and he really brought, he was the guy who really was the glue to bring those songs to life in Night Ranger. And not only that, but he sang two hits that the, the Night Ranger had. That makes his top ten, Sister Christian and Sentimental Street. So he was a singing drummer. Visually, as you probably know, they set his drums up on the side of the stage so you can kind of see him sing and play, which was really cool. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, uh, I mean, and he was a great live drummer to see. So I know that wouldn't kind of maybe hit your radar or some of your fans, but if you if you just give him a moment to, to check him out and listen to this guy play and what he brings, not just to the drums, but to the band and to the sound of the band, Kelly is one of the best. Yeah, man. You know, I've never been huge in a Night Ranger, Ranger but I definitely uh, respect them. So I respect that choice. Thank you. All right. Number two. <laughs> You're number two. Number two. Yeah! I got Eric Singer. And this dude is just a monster, right? I mean, obviously Kiss, of course. That I think that's where... That's where I really was exposed to this guy. Hey, kiss exposed, no pun intended. Um, but you know, yeah. he played with Badlands, he played with Black Sabbath, Alice Cooper, he, he, Lita Ford. He's, you know, we all know all the different things that he's done. But like, I forgot that theme. Right, all night I've been saying something to prove. You're coming in in 1992. Eric Carr has passed away. You're the first new member of Kiss in a few years. You know what I mean? Bruce Kulick and Eric Carr were kind of like a stable lineup with Paul and Gene for quite a while. So there was definitely something to prove. There also was a musical style change kind of going on. It was like you couldn't do the the typical hair metal stuff anymore. Things were getting a little bit heavier. And with all those things combined, man, Eric Singer just hit it out of the park. Listen to Revenge. It's a sick-ass album, and his drumming is just next level. Listen to a Live 3. Everything on a Live 3 is like a heavier rendition with a lot of extra double bass, really intricate drumming, and it makes Kiss sound like a more tighter band. You know what I mean? Kiss just went up another night. No disrespect to Eric Carr. Eric Carr, he, we, I might might mention him again here in a second, but um, no, not to steal my own thunder, but you know something about what was going on with the way Eric Singer interpreted these songs 
it really did take him to the next level and it was the perfect spot to be in you know at the time of 1992 when music was kind of changing but another thing i want to mention about eric singer is he's a great vocalist really toward the end of kiss he had to carry kiss vocally because Paul, unfortunately, just couldn't sing as great as he used to. Gene's voice has kind of always been, is, it is what it is. Eric would do a lot of the high parts on, on the harmony. So yeah. he's a great singer. Anytime he gets a shot to sing on some of the studio albums, he sounds great. And don't forget how we played on uh, Kiss Unplugged. It's so tight, and you can't hide any of the mistakes. You know what I mean? You okay? You make a mistake on a, you know in a, a live setting where everything's cranked up. Well, okay, you know, no big deal. You might not be able to even catch it. But in the unplugged setting, he's so tight, and he plays what's right, you know, appropriate for the songs. But then he just goes sick. Listen to, like, Coming Home. Uh, on Kiss Unplugged. It's so insane and so good. Sure know something also sounds incredible. So I just went on a massive fast tirade about Eric Singer. <laughs> but uh, he's, he's awesome, man. What do you think, Eric I Singer? love Eric. You know what? Um, when you started this conversation and you mentioned Eric Singer, I, I started writing down Revenge, Alive 3, and then, of course, you mentioned it. Um, but, you know, I saw the Revenge tour in Toronto, and Trickster opened up this show. I remember that, and so did Faster Pussycat. I have no idea how I remember this, but um, it was a great show, and that was the first time I got to see Eric Singer in person. And I had floor seats, and he blew my mind because you mentioned very rock oriented when they open and i think they opened up with detroit rock city but the double bass that he played and just the the, the way he hit the drum and he had a set of pearls which i think were also um uh the silver ones that yeah i think that that's back in revenge he had the silver pearls that he played mm -hmm. yeah and 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 they sounded absolutely amazing he had his cymbals up high the big reach he looked good and boy alive three you mentioned it that is kiss to me, a live three is Kiss at its absolute best. The sound of the album, yep. the way the drums were played, and again, no disrespect to Eric Carr, he's one of my favorites too. You know, Peter Chris, I wasn't really in the Peter Chris space. I wasn't right. into Kiss that early. And and so I respect what he did for the band and what he means to the band, but really when you asked me the best drummer in Kiss, it would have been me, but I never had the opportunity. So we're gonna say <laughs> Eric Singer is the best drummer in Kiss. And I don't know about you, but I got to meet Eric Singer, I don't know, three or four times and chat with him and just a super polite guy. In fact, I'm in my office right now, my, my studio. I am looking on my wall. It says Eric Singer 2004. I think it's a drum head that he signed for me. And it's on my uh, studio wall right now. So huge fan of Eric Singer. Yeah, and the only thing that I want to say too about Eric Singer is that, you know, strangely enough, obviously he got back into Kiss playing the role of the Catman with makeup, something I, I would never have believed if you told me that, like, in 1992. And the only thing that kind of bugged me a little bit, Shane, is that when he got back into Kiss, I feel like they kind of neutered him a little bit. Like, they, I felt like he was almost told to play like Pete, Peter. You know, he had, like, single bass drum for, like, when he first got back into the band. And, you know, that's fine. I get it. They were trying to put on that kind of a show, like the old Kiss. But, like, I, I agree with you 100%. Alive 3 will always be my favorite Alive, and there's just something about this. So even though it was cool that he was back, and I think as he progressed, as he got toward the end, they let him, you know, go loose a little bit. But I just think that when he got in there in 92, that was the best version of him and, and one of the best versions of Kiss. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Now we're down to the big one right now. This, this is the man, big one. this is going to be a heavy hitter, right? What do we got? <laughs> Well, I don't know if this guy is a heavy hitter, but he's a heavy hitter in this band, I find. Um, you may or may not know this, but for a number of years, I played drums in a, in a Poison tribute band. And although Ricky Rocket was never the best drummer, most technical drummer, and early on, you know, the albums weren't great. Look what the Cat Drag did, had some great songs, but, you know, it was pretty basic. Yep. But I will tell you, from following this guy's career right up until now, not only did he turn into a great drummer, but he really was the glue that, that held that band together through so many issues, obviously, that they've had over the years. Uh, Flesh and Blood is a great album, but I'm telling you, when he got to Native Tongue and he put the drums on that album, that defined how great he was. I know he had a different guitar player in Richie Kotzen, 
but songs like The Screams. Strike Up the Band, Fire and Ice, Seven Days Over You, like such amazing songs. And I realize Poison doesn't play a lot of them now. Um, and I get it, but but he really, at that point, proved to me how great he was. He was the epitome of glam rock and roll. He had style over substance, maybe, but it didn't matter because it sold tickets. Chicks went to the show. Hot girls would be there. Men would come and watch them play. They, the band did it right. He did it right. And, and he is 100% that Poison brand besides Brett Michaels. And so for all those reasons, Ricky Rocket is my all-time favorite drummer, so he is number one on my list. Dude, I am so excited that you put him at number one. He would probably be my number eight if we had if we went a little bit farther on this list. And it was so weird because as soon as you said him, I was like, yeah, I'm so glad because I want to talk about him too. And then you nailed like every single thing that I was thinking because I think he was a great showman. I think like he would do weird, you know, twirl around his sticks and everything in the beginning. And he was a good showman and he was an okay drummer. But man, you get the flesh and blood, like just like you said. And like the Alley of Lost Souls and all this shit. Like, it's like, who is this yep. guy? Where's this guy been? You know? And then when you get to Native Tongue, it's totally even next level. Like, all that stuff that starts off in the beginning of like the scream of, you know, the beginning of uh, of the Native Tongue album. Yep. It's so good. I thought the same thing. When you watch him play, like, I think they played on um, oh, the Tonight Show. They do Fire and Ice until you suffer some. And it's just so yep. peaceful. Everything he's doing, you know? And, uh, it's just so good. I'm so glad you put him on. And he, you're right. He really did evolve. The whole band did, in my opinion. You know, And they don't get enough credit for it. I think that people always look back to like the way they looked when they started and the way they sounded when they started. But, man, Flesh and Blood and Native Tongue. If they could just do another album, like the two of those mixed, I'd be a happy person. <laughs> well, before you give your number one, in my interview with Tom Worman, who produced Open Up and Stay Off, he had said to me, he said, you know, when Ricky came in the studio, he said – to him, he says, "Listen, I'm not, I'm not the greatest drummer. I'm really not. Um, but, but I'm, I'm willing to listen, and I'm willing to learn, and I'm willing to give you the best version of me I can to make these great songs. And when I hear that about a guy like Ricky or like Tommy Lee, what I had said, uh, you know, like I just feel like th that gives you a nice, warm feeling that the music really does matter. It's not just about chicks and you know booze and partying, but." They really did want to put a good product out, and I believe Poison always wanted to. They struggled early on, but once, even when it got to open up and say off, they put some, I mean, their, their only number one hit came off that album with Every Rose. Yep. But, but I mean, they really started to up their game, and then, you know, we said with Flesh and Blood, Native Tongue, they really knocked it out of the park. So, Awesome. So glad you put them on there. Well, I'm going to say cue... You're number one. Cue the drum beat. Oh, oh, jeez. Oh, 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 shit. <laughs> Eric Carr, baby. Oh, man. How did I know you were going to say Well, you kind of gave it away when you I said did that Eric Carr I did, I did. But anyway. But, but, you know, man, it's my favorite band of all time. And when I got into the band, this was the guy who was the drummer. And it's, it's one of those rare instances where you've got somebody who's such a great talent and is a great human being. You know what I mean? It's a win-win. And the dude had the best hair in the band. I think that's why they always said there was friction between Paul Stanley and Eric Carr. As I think because Eric Carr had better hair than Paul. Paul got mad. But um, <laughs> just a cool-looking dude, cool guy. Even, like, even with the makeup, man, the Fox was such a cool-looking character. Yeah. And... Hate to sound like a broken record, man, but this is a guy that's got something to prove. He's heading into one of the biggest bands of all time, replacing an iconic member like Peter Chris. And what does he do? He just kicks it up to the next level. Just listen to Kiss, 1980s in the Australia. <laughs> Okay, actually, go back and listen to him in 79 at, you know, at the Largo show, and then go listen to him in 80. Um, listen to Detroit Rock City right off the get-go. Eric Carr is crushing it, doing double bass, thunderous drums. Uh, it's just killer. Now, he played on The Elder. You know, whatever. The Elder's kind of just like there. You know, I, I wouldn't even say that's a true Kiss-like album. It's a cool album, but it's not a true Kiss album. He's got something. Is that to not prove. supposed to be a concept record or something? Yeah, it's a concept that's really shitty. But anyways, yeah. so he gets. Yeah, the to, concept is it's stuck. <laughs> so he gets to Creatures of the Night, and here it is. The guy's got something to prove. You know what I mean? Metal's coming in, and Kiss needs to kind of rejuvenate themselves. And that album, 
you ask most drummers, and you probably appreciate this album, most drummers love the way the drums sound on that album because they're just mammoth. They recorded them in like a bathroom with, with like all kinds of boom mics and all this kind of stuff. And it's, like I said, it's, it's just monstrous. And when he hits those toms, it's like it's going to break your ribs or something. So I feel, always felt like Creatures of the Night was like an MVP moment for Eric Carr, also for Gene Simmons. And we talk about spectacles. It doesn't get any bigger of a spectacle than when somebody's on a tank, right? And the tank goes forward and it's yep. blowing off explosions and the guy's just thundering through the uh, through the songs. But I think throughout the whole 80s, he was, you know, he was the heartbeat of that band. Watch him on Animalize Live. Watch how the crowd responds to him when he does his drum solo. another innovator he brought in the sonic uh, drum pads and they would play like music yeah. on them you know and he would kind of almost put on a little musical performance all by himself with the drum pads and everything so uh there's just so much to unpack with this get with this dude man but just a a great uh, a great drummer sounds like he was a great guy never got to meet him obviously uh rest in peace man eric carr because like i said you're somebody that people look fondly upon and the great memories of all the concerts and, and albums that you played on so yeah Eric Carr, man, number one. Uh, so Eric Carr plays on one of my favorite Kiss songs of all time on an album that was just average. But I will tell you, the drums and the sound of Hide Your Heart is one of my favorite mm-hmm. Kiss songs mm-hmm. ever. And there's just something about it. And it, the story is great. Oh, definitely. <laughs> but... but, but but uh, j- just his playing forever, you know, is a ballad. But, you know, Asylum was okay. Crazy Night, you know, that got to that point of, you know, we're trying to be a little bit more, I don't know, melodic, melodic radio friendly. I don't know yeah, what it was. Pop, but, yeah. But they had some sure. great songs. Yeah, very poppy. But, but he did a great job. I'm a huge fan. You know, when I was in the early 90s um, going to college and I played in a band and the bass player, we we rehearsed at his house. And he would always put to get us ready. So we were like 22 or whatever it was, and 21 maybe. We would get beer. We would sit in front of watching Kiss Alive or Kiss Live rather, not Alive, Kiss Live with with, with uh, Eric Carr. And we would watch that for a half hour, pound booze, and then we'd go downstairs. And That's we killer. Would rehearse That's a killer concert. And, and, and that was like just, one of the first times I ever seen Kiss. A, a Kiss live video, and that dude, he's playing the songs at a light speed, you know what I mean? They're fast. All the guys, Gene and Paul, they're oh, running yeah. around like maniacs, and it's uh, it's just high energy, man. That's what he was all about, high energy. I know that we've gotten to number one, and I do have to go to, but I, can I throw out some names to you just of yeah. people that I, I just love, and I'll be real quick. Of course. Rob Afuso from Skid Row. Yeah. Uh, Rob, Rob, Rob's a great drummer. You know, uh, Rob Hammersmith is a very good friend of mine right now who plays in Skid Row. But Rob Afuso is just the drum parts he came up on those early albums from Skid Row were amazing. Um, I can't go without mentioning Alex Van Halen, of a course. true innovator, one of the most talented drummers ever. I'm looking forward to his book called Brothers, which will be out in the fall. It's not going to mimic your book. Your book's going to be way better and more popular, <laughs> I'm sure. But anyway, Alex does have a book coming up. Tommy Aldridge, you know, yes. from Finn Lizzy to Pat Travers to Ozzy, and of course, Whitesnake. Seen him a number of times. And because I'm Canadian, Neil Peart, one of the best drummers of all time, of and course. Rick Allen, because any, anybody who can, you know, get in an accident New Year's Eve in 84 and put out a fucking album like Hysteria <laughs> in 87. Uh, and so I just wanted to mention those as some of my favorites as well. And uh, uh, Dean Castronova, because I'm interviewing him tomorrow, is up on that list. So there you have it. Those are all killer. The only one that I really want to mention, and I was like, I was so torn. I wanted to put this on there so bad. And he's another one we lost uh, recently. Was Steve Riley? And I think that Steve Riley. Oh, from LA Guns. Yeah, yeah, LA Guns. But I actually prefer uh, his days in Wasp and uh, Wasp. Yeah, yeah, Live yeah, in the Raw. Cool. If you go, if, if you ever, I don't know if you've listened to that album at all, but his drum sound and drum performance on Live in the Raw is just killer. So I had to mention that one. I mean, I could go, we, we could go all night. There's a ton of drummers that I love and respect, but uh, I think we, I think we did a good job with this, man. We lined up a couple times, so yeah, we did good. Yeah, and you know something? Again, I listen to your podcast. I do on a regular basis, and I, I listen to it. Um, not to hear your fucking voice, but I listen to it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like People the are sick of that. I'm gonna. <laughs> I, I'm gonna I'm gonna learn something new or about a band that I didn't know. Same with reading your book. I, I was reading these 
well, who the hell is this band? And so what do you do? You go to Google and uh, or YouTube and you put something in there. And, you know, I, I did listen to Dangerous Boys, Bango Tango a little bit. You know, Shotgun Messiah, I know that's in your book, and I'm yep. a huge fan of yep. Shotgun Messiah. But, but you know, there were some things I found in here where I was like, man, I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that happened. Or I didn't never heard of that band. So that's what this is all about, right, bringing to the forefront. I know I got a pussy list because I'm a pop rock guy. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> No man, it was cool, I, I, and I was it's great to talk to you. I think we've talked you know, we've talked online, but not not like in this uh, format. So this is great, and you're right, man, hundred percent. That's people always say like you know why do you do it? You know there's there's really no money in this stuff. What are you doing? And really that that's the joy of it. It's because we love the music, want to share it with other people. That's what it's all about. So like I said, if people discover new bands. You know, because let's face it, there's not not going to be a ton of new bands coming out that play the kind of music we like. There's a ton of old ones out there that you miss. So if you can go back and find them, it's a great thing. Absolutely. And if anybody ever wants to check out my interviews, I do put them on my website, which is uh, shanechristopherneal.com. There's a ton of interviews that I've done. And I I didn't mention this, but I work in the country space as well. So there's a ton of country interviews and rock interviews, but a lot of drummers. I'm telling you, I give love to a lot of drummers, drummers. Uh, during the podcast. So there you have it. That's awesome. What I'll do, buddy, is I'll put all the links to like your social media and your YouTube channel and everything you got out there so everybody can find it and check out what you do. Well, you have a great night, man. Thanks for coming on. Okay, brother. Take care of yourself, all right? Yep. Take care.